I'd like you to take the Word of God with me, please, and open in the New Testament to the book of Colossians, chapter number 1. And we'll read a few verses together here in just a moment. The pastor got so stirred up during the song, I almost didn't get to preach tonight. And so I really do appreciate the opportunity to preach today, and uh, it's meaningful to me. This is our home church and the place we love, and we're thankful to God for our pastor. And like you, Sunday after Sunday, I think we take a lot for granted in a place like this. Uh, but we sit under a pastor that preaches the Bible to us. And uh, I told someone recently, I think he's preaching better than I've ever heard him. And God is using him in a powerful way. And I'm grateful to God just to be a part of what the Lord is doing at the Temple Baptist Church. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 1. The Bible says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae. This is not what I'm preaching on, but I love, this, I love this reference to both their spiritual position as well as their geographical. They're in Christ, they're at Colossae. We are in Christ at Pal. You could be in Christ and at any other place. But the great place we are is we are in Christ. Aren't you glad to be in Christ tonight? Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints, well, the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day you heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. For this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord and to all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of of sins. I'd like you to mark two phrases in your Bible, if you would. In verse number three, the closing phrase, praying always for you. And then again in verse number nine, we do not cease to pray for you. I'd like to ask a question tonight before I begin to take you through this portion of Scripture. How many of you have somebody you love that you are genuinely praying for? Would you raise your hand, please? The question is this, how do you pray for those you love? How do you pray for those you love? I want to tell you that I intend when I finish preaching tonight to ask us to have a prayer meeting. I don't know of a church that's more of a praying church than this church is. I'll tell you, if I, if I had a need, this would be the church I'd want to be a member of. Because this is a place where people bear one another's burdens. They get under the load with you. Now, this is a praying church. But I want to remind you that being a member of a praying church and being a praying Christian are two different things. It is possible to be a part of a church where they really pray and they bombard heaven and they have prayer meetings and prayer lists and all those things are going on, and this church does. But if I'm not engaged in praying, and if you're not engaged in praying, if, if we are not intercessors one for another, then we're missing out on the blessing and we're not providing what we ought to provide to our church family because this is the way God designed for it to be. I want to give you a list. I'd like for you to write some things down tonight, if you will, because I'm hoping you'll take this list and make it your own prayer list. You know, in no other area of the Christian life is our selfishness more profoundly seen than in our prayer lives. If you want to see how selfish you really are, listen to yourself pray. Because for the most part, 
We spend an awful lot of time praying for our needs and what we desire and what we think ought to happen and not nearly enough time praying for others that desperately need our prayers. Now, I want to suggest to you there's only really one person who's worthy of being called the intercessor, and his name is Jesus Christ. Look, nobody ever prayed like Jesus prayed, and I want to encourage you tonight, he's still doing that at this very moment. As a matter of fact, the work of the Lord Jesus is intercessory work. Isaiah 53, verse number 12 says that he made intercession for the transgressors. How many of you have ever transgressed even one of God's laws? Would you raise your hand? Then the Bible says Jesus has been praying for you. And he didn't stop at Calvary. He didn't stop with his earthly ministry. No, the Bible says in Hebrews that he ever liveth making intercession for you and I. Old Robert Murray McShane said, if I could hear Jesus praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a thousand enemies. Then he stopped and said, but the distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. You might not be able to see him at this moment. You might not be able to hear him at this moment. But I want you to know if another person on earth didn't call your name to God today, you can be sure of this. The Lord Jesus did. And the son always gets his prayers answered. He is the great intercessor. As a matter of fact, Every time you and I intercede for others in prayer, you know what you're really doing? You're coming to be one with Jesus in his work. I really believe intercessory prayer is the highest level of prayer because that's the way Jesus prays. It's not all about me. Uh, I think it was Andrew Murray that said he had come to the place to believe that even his prayers for himself, he now believed to simply be God's way of getting him ready to pray for other people. Would to God more of us felt that way. The problem is this. We're so distracted. We even make promises and we say to people, I'm going to pray for you, and then we fail to do that. And years ago, pastor challenged us to start keeping a prayer list, which I think is a wonderful idea. We'll have Christian Life Journals this week in the Youth Congress, and you can get a copy of one. And in that, there is a, there is a prayer list for every day, starting on Sunday and all the way through the week. And I'd recommend that you use something like that so that every day you're praying and you're praying specifically. But here's one of the traps that I fell into. And I have battled, and it is this. Sometimes my prayer list is just names. And that may be good as a reminder, but we've got to do more than know for whom we're praying. We need to know for what we're praying for those people. In other words, I'm praying for my wife, but specifically, what am I praying for her? I'm praying for my children, but what am I praying for them? I'm praying for my pastor, but is it just, Lord, bless the pastor today? Or am I praying something specific for him and for his family and for the ministry of this church? We pray for one another, but we ought to pray more specifically. And I don't know another way to do this that I think is any better than to take one of the very prayer list of Scripture. This particular one happens to be the prayer list of the Apostle Paul. You can't go wrong there. This was a man of prayer. As a matter of fact, the book of Colossians, the letter to the church at Colossae, was written when Paul was in prison. I want you to get this picture in your mind for a minute. Here's a man chained and bound and in a prison cell. And what is he doing with his time? Is he complaining? Is he fussing? Is he grumbling? No. In Ephesians, he says, I bow my knee. See that aged apostle persecuted on bended knee. He's taking that time to intercede and bombard heaven and see what God will do. Oh, sure, he writes to these churches and he writes letters, but in every one of them, he gives some prayer. That's fascinating to me. Because Paul, as great a man as he was, as great an apostle as he was, as spirit-filled a preacher as he was, he did not believe he could change them. He believed only God could change them. And that if he would pray, God would speak to them. How many of you know somebody right now, you're sure wishing God would speak to them? Well, let me tell you how to do that. Don't start by you talking to them. Start by you talking to God about them. Paul bombarded heaven for them and he said, I'm praying for you. As a matter of fact, twice he says it in verse number three. Again, in verse number nine, he says, I'm praying for you. And I love this terminology in verse nine. He says, I do not cease to pray for you. Sounds an awful lot like what he wrote in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17. Pray without what, church? Ceasing. He says, I just keep on praying. You know an interesting thing? Paul had never been to Colossae. He didn't start this church. He was ministering 100 miles away in a city called Ephesus and he preached the gospel and some people got saved and they said, we got to get this to other places also. 
And they carried the gospel 100 miles away to Colossae and people started getting saved and discipled there. A church sprung up. A pastor named Epaphras rose through the ranks and God used him in a mighty way. And Paul had never even been there. But he's praying for them. I want to tell you tonight that you can pray for those you love and you can even pray for strangers that you love in Christ if you know that you're praying in the will of God. And some of you, I have no idea who I'm talking to tonight. Some of you are so burdened. You're broken for a child or a grandchild. You're, you're thinking of a loved one or somebody you prayed for years to be saved. You think your prayers aren't getting through and God's not hearing and nothing's going on. Wait just a second. Paul could not see the answers to his prayer. He heard occasional reports, but he could not see the answers. So what did he do? He said, I just I want you to know, I'm just going to keep praying these things for you. And I'm going to see what God will do. And before I give you the list, I want to give you one little thought God has convicted me about. Everything on the list is a spiritual thing. That doesn't mean it's wrong to pray for physical things or financial things or emotional things or relational things. I think all that is perfectly right. But I want you to know the greatest emphasis of our prayers ought not be for things. It ought to be for God to accomplish His work in the lives of people because when the spiritual takes place, look, God makes sure everything else gets cared for. So what's on Paul's prayer list? Paul, tell us, teach us how to pray for those we love. Now look at verse number 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. And to desire. I've circled in my Bible the word pray and the word desire and connected the two. Look, you don't pray for what just you desire. You pray for what God desires. You're not asking selfishly for what you think ought to be done. No, you're using the very word of God. By the way, church, let me tell you something. When you pray in the word of God, you can be sure you're praying in the will of God. You say, I wish I knew how to pray for that person. Well, why don't you find a portion of scripture and pray that portion of scripture for that person? Coming one with God. He said, here's my desire. Number one, write it down, would you please? That you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. The first thing Paul prays for is this. Pray, pray that they would know and understand the will of God. You might want to mark in your Bible these words, knowledge and wisdom and understanding because all of it is connected to them understanding the will of God for their lives. There's a reason why I'm bringing this message to you tonight. It is this. In just a few hours, hundreds of teenagers from all over this country are going to invade us. They're going to roll in on buses and vans and in cars. And they're going to show up to enjoy two or three days and then hear a lot of preaching and a lot of teaching. And that's all wonderful. But I'm going to tell you what they really need. They need somebody to pray for them. Did you know that most children in America have no one praying for them? Most teenagers. No one ever calls their name to God. You know why I'm standing here tonight? I'm standing here tonight because people have prayed for me. I know the Lord Jesus prays for me and I'm grateful to God for that. I have a praying dad and I have a praying mother. I had praying grandparents. I have a pastor that prays for me. I know I have dear friends who pray for me on a regular basis, sometimes strangers. Recently, a woman in a wheelchair, a young woman in a wheelchair, came to me, and I had never seen her before in my life. She said, I just want you to know that I pray for you every day of my life. I have not forgotten her words. She's a stranger to me. Oh, but she's not a stranger because we're in the same family. We have the same father. And by the way, intercessory work is family work. That's really what it is. Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, I exhort first of all that supplications and prayers and intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men. Oh, we're pretty good on the, on the supplication. Lord, I got a need. But what about the intercession? You know what touches my heart as a daddy? When one of my children tries to plead the case of another one of the children. How many of you parents know that doesn't happen very often, right? Oh, we're pretty good at pleading our own case, but... I tell you, when one of my children comes to me and tries to plead the case of another, oh, dad's heart is touched. Let me tell you what touches the heart of the Heavenly Father. When one child of God goes into the Father's throne room and says, Father, I want to talk to you, but it's not about me. I want to talk to you about another one of your children. I'm concerned about them. I want you to know that touches the heart of God. 
Oh, I know it's a wicked world. Colossae was not a very nice place to live when it came to the Christian faith. They'd been invaded by philosophy and invaded by legalizers and man ruled supreme. That's why Paul wrote this letter to tell them, no, Christ is all and you're complete in Christ and Jesus is enough. I'm gonna tell you what young people in our world need. They need more than a lecture. They need more than a series of sermons. They, they need more than another book to read or, or somebody peering over their shoulder and breathing down their neck. They need somebody to get down on their face and call their name to God and say, oh God, please open their eyes so they'll understand your will for their life. Look, they don't understand God's will because we tell them what is God's will. They understand God's will because the Spirit of God opens their understanding. And that happens when we pray for that. By the way, could I give you a word of just admonition here, a word of advice? When you see good things happening, pray more. You know what we have a tendency to do? We see a little, a little advance in an area and we say, oh, they're doing good, that's wonderful. Can I tell you, the devil hates that kind of advance. Spiritual attack is coming, persecution is coming, and that's the moment where we ought to really bear down and begin to pray to see what God will do. These believers at Colossae, you read these verses with me, they were doing good. Their faith was spoken of throughout the whole world. Man, things were going well. And Paul said, because of that, for this cause, I pray for you. I pray you won't get sidetracked somewhere. A few years ago, a man that I admire greatly had lunch with me and he said to me, an older man, he said to me, I want to give you a piece of advice. You're, you're young and you've got a lot to learn. And I said, you're right. And he talked to me about several things and then the last thing I've never forgotten. He said to me, Scott, I want to tell you at this stage in your life, you need to pray more for your children and for your wife than you've ever prayed for. And he said, every day of your life, you need to pray a hedge around them because the enemy wants to attack. And I can't tell you how many hundreds of times the Holy Spirit has brought that to my mind. And I want to say to you tonight, whoever it is, look, whose face is in your mind right now? Whose, whose name is in your mind right now? Pray for them. Pray that God will help them know his will. Pray that they'll understand what it is God is trying to do in their life. And I love the word he uses in verse number nine. He says, pray they'll be filled with it. You know what that means? It literally means overflowing, totally consumed. Look, we ought to pray for every teenager in the Temple Baptist Church that they would be totally controlled by the will of God. That in a world where they're gonna hear a lot of error, they'll know the truth and it will consume them. In a world where they're gonna see a lot, of, a lot of nasty things going on around them, they'll be totally controlled by the will of God for their life. But it doesn't stop there. Look at the second thing in verse number 10. Here's the second thing on Paul's prayer list. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. If you're writing the list down, here we go. Number two, pray that they would please the Lord with their lives. Can I tell you that far too often I have prayed that others would please me with their life. That they would do what I want them to do. That they would do something that makes me happy. That's selfish praying and it's really not praying at all. No, real praying is where we say, Lord, not just thy will be done in my life, but thy will be done in their life. I walked an aisle in a youth meeting like we're going to have this week. I was 12. And I told the Lord I would do whatever he wanted me to do with my life. And do you know the first person that knelt beside me in that altar was my daddy. And it's weird how the devil plays mind games, isn't it? He's such a liar. Don't you hate the devil? He had me convinced that somehow my parents would not be excited about my decision. I don't know why. My dad put his arm around me and wept and he said, Son, I'm so glad you're yielded to God. Can I tell you that growing up in those teen years, I made a lot of mistakes and I, I had a lot to learn. I still got a lot to learn. But growing up through those teen years, if it had not been for my mom and dad who were willing to let God do what God wanted to do in my life, I wouldn't have made it. I'm preaching to me now, not to you. I'm thinking about my own children right now. Am I willing to pray, Lord, thy will be done with their life. I just want them to please you. 
You know what's amazing? He moves from verse 9 to verse 10, from the knowing the will of God to the doing of the will of God. In other words, look, I want more than just to know what God wants. I want to do what God wants. And I love this, all pleasing, all, I want my son to please God. I want my girls to please God. Pray for your children and grandchildren to please God. When you come in this auditorium on Wednesday night, there's going to be a lot of young people in here. Be here to encourage them. But when you walk through the doors, you say, how do we pray? Pray this way. Oh, God, get a hold of these young people's hearts so they'll please God with their life. Amen. This is the way you pray for those you love. And then he goes on. He presses it in verse 10. He says, being fruitful in every good work. Number three, write it down. Would you pray that they'd bear fruit? Bear fruit. Now the world's word for all of this is they'd be productive. That's a really weak word. God's word is fruit. What's the difference? If I'm productive, I'm producing it. But if I'm fruitful, some other power is doing the producing. Then I'm just yielded and abiding and I'm bearing that fruit. Look at me just a moment. We're not trying to get teenagers to do more. That's not it. Pastor's burden this year in this Congress is to get young people to just wave the white flag to Jesus and yield. Look, please, because a yielded life is a fruitful life. Oh, and it's wonderful. Look, there is no life like it on earth. Can I tell you one of the things I hope the young people get this week? I hope they get a hold of the fact that the Christian life is a happy life. As a matter of fact, I think the happiest people on earth ought to be God's children. Not dragging around, moping through life, how terrible it is, how rough we have it, we're just enduring to the end. No, there is joy in serving Jesus Christ. Well, Mr. Haley that put together Haley's Bible Handbook wrote a little section about how to study the Bible. In it, he used George Mueller as an example. And he quoted Mr. Mueller as saying that after 67 years with the Lord, he had learned that his time in the Word of God and prayer every day was the only thing that made him, and I quote, happy, happy, happy. Duck Dynasty did not invent that particular thing. No, no, look please. Happy, happy, happy people are people who know Jesus and love Jesus and walk with Jesus. And if young people could get a hold of that and be fruitful, what kind of fruit? How about that fruit of the Spirit, the Lord's love, the Lord's joy, and the Lord's peace? and the Lord's long-suffering, and the Lord's gentleness, and goodness, and faith, and meekness, and temperance, and sometimes, oh, give us some young people like that. Pray that God would make young people like that. That didn't happen on accident. Somebody's praying somewhere. Somebody said that every great movement of God could be traced to a kneeling figure. I thought the other day, you know, in, in this church, there ought, to be a, there ought to be a team of people, an army of people, that pray for the pastor of this church in an intense way every day, that hold up his arms in faith and say, we're grateful we have a man of God and God's doing something in this place and we can't do everything, but we can pray and get in on it. God, make him fruitful. Every one of us ought to have that kind of heart. This morning, I, I gave just a little word about the New Hebrides revival and the great work that was done there. And you know, Duncan Campbell, he, he got a lot of press, if you will, because he was the preacher. He, he was the man preaching there on the Isle of Lewis for those two years and thousands being saved and churches being restarted and big things going on. But I want you to know, at the judgment seat of Christ, it wasn't about Duncan Campbell. They're two unnamed women. Nobody even remembers their name now, 82 and 84, one of them blind that met for weeks and prayed that God would visit their island. And you may not be the preacher in the meeting, you may not even be the teacher in the meeting, but every last one of us could be the prayers in the meeting, asking God to break through and do something out of the ordinary. That's what we need. And this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Let's go back to Paul's list for a minute. Look at verse number 10. Here's the fourth thing. An increasing in the knowledge of God. Pray this. Pray that they would know God. Somebody said, they already know God. Yes, but pray they would know him more. There's no place to stop, is there? Matter of fact, I was noticing this 
earlier today in verse number six, he talks about the fruit of the gospel. It bringeth forth fruit. So I mark fruit in verse six. Then you come to verse 10, he says, but I want you to be fruitful in every good work. You know, the idea is here, you have fruit, but now I want to see more fruit. Hey, you know God now, you all desire to know him more. The greatest knowledge our children can have. And the greatest knowledge any young person will ever get is not the knowledge they get from a college or a university. It is not the knowledge of things and facts and figures. It is not street knowledge. It is not the ability to get through life or walk into a place and snap their fingers and make something happen. It is the knowledge of a holy God. Would you help me this week? Would you help me pray that the young people who sit in these meetings will come to know God in a greater way? And then you, look, you make the application where you need to. Pray it for your family. Pray it for your children. Pray it for somebody that you know. Lord, help them increase in the knowledge of God. Look at all these alls. Verse 9, all wisdom. Verse 10, all pleasing. Verse 11, all might. Verse 11, all patience. I mean, look, it just goes on and on and on. Look, Jesus is enough. And the greatest thing you ever learn in life is the sufficiency of Christ. How many of you know these teenagers that are in our church and teenagers who will be here this week are going to face some unique temptations in the days to come? Look, friends, it's coming. This country's in a mess. And persecution is on its way. You mark it down. In our lifetime, believers will face legitimate persecution in the land of the free and the home of the brave. So what are we going to do? Wring our hands and talk about how bad it is? Give up? No! We ought to pray right now. Oh, God, help us realize Jesus is enough. And every temptation and every trouble and every test and every trial is just another opportunity to prove that Jesus is enough. Pray this for those you love. Then he gives another thing, a fifth thing. Look at it in verse 11. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. Pray that those you love would learn to live in God's strength. There is a strength that is not God's strength. It's the strength of force and flesh in this world. And that's the only strength most people ever learn to live in. But there is a strength, friends, to resist the tempter. A stick to -itiveness. You ever wonder about people, good people, who sit on the same church pew, and in a five-year span, some of them are gone, and others of them are still sitting there? I've wondered about that. Look, I grew up in a preacher's home. I've watched people in churches all my life. And I've wondered. And sometimes the ones that you really thought they are going to stick with it, they didn't stick with it at all. And then there are those just plodding forward, just moving forward. You know what the difference is? One of them learned the secret to being strengthened in their inner man. You can't do that for somebody else, but you can pray that for somebody else and see what God will do for them. And then read on. The Bible says, and I like this one, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. He didn't just say patience and long suffering. He said patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Write this down, number six. Pray that they would deal with every difficulty with joy. Pray that they would learn what it means for the joy of the Lord to be their strength. Would you look at me just a moment, church? We all have hard things with which to deal, and some of you are going to face some hard things this week. But I'm going to just remind you of something. You have Jesus. He is with you. He is not going to leave you. He's never forsaken you, and He's not going to start now. And if you'll learn to be a rejoicing Christian, then you can wait with the joy that God's at work. You can even suffer if Jesus calls on you to do that with the knowledge that God is at work. Pray that for those you love. And then when we think the list is finished, he adds one. Look at verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father. I want you to write down a seventh thing here, would you please? Pray that they would develop a grateful heart. I'll tell you something God's really been convicting me about. That is my lack of gratitude. 
You ever wonder why people go off the deep end and do crazy things and get involved in terrible sin? I would say to you it is because they are not grateful like they ought to be. As a matter of fact, I am convinced of this more every day that a thankful spirit is as good a protection against sin and temptation as anything else. Because when you realize how good God has been to you. Look, friends, the goodness of God not only leads you to repentance, it keeps you there. And when you start pondering how wonderful Jesus has been. Look, how many of you would like our young people and our children to not just get through high school? Look, there's got to be more to it than cross your fingers and hope they don't mess up, mess their life up. How many of you would like to see them get out of high school, go off to college, serve the Lord, and have truly Christian homes? Let's vote on it. How many of you would like to see that? Me too. Let me tell you how, how that has to happen. Not by us telling them what they have to do by reminding them what Jesus has done for them. Because when you get captured with how wonderful Jesus has been, say, well, I don't know, I'm having a tough time. You may be, but look at what Jesus has done for you. Verse 12, he's made you meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Verse 13, he's delivered you from the power of darkness. He's translated you to the kingdom of his dear son. He's redeemed you through his blood and forgiven every sin you ever committed. And based on that, you ought to desire to be true to him all the days of your life. I'll give you one verse and I'm done. I'd like for you to turn back in your Bible to the book of Romans for just a moment. So Romans chapter 8 and verse number 26. You know one of the first lessons you learn when you start praying? that you don't know how to pray. I remember one of our children, young children, learning to pray, called on to pray one night, prayed a wonderful prayer and got halfway through the prayer and I could sense there was some hesitancy and finally just stopped. We all sat there in that awkward silence for just a couple moments, wondering what was going to come out of their mouth. Finally, I opened one eye and looked. And that child opened their eye and looked at me and said these words honestly. I don't know what else to pray for. And I said, I understand, because I do. The truth of the matter is, there's been a lot of times I've wanted to pray for somebody, but I didn't know how to pray. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 26, likewise. The Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Watch this. The Holy Spirit is praying for me. And there, the Lord Jesus is praying for me. Now watch. And if I'll simply take the word that he has left, and make, look please, this my prayer list. You know, prayer lists can become a routine. They can become a rut. You can get stuck in them. You can get to the place where you're just reading off a piece of paper things because you think that's what you're supposed to pray for today. But wait, if you'll let it be a living communication with God, if you'll take God's very words and pray those things for those you love, you'll be amazed at how God answers those prayers. Because in the words of Mr. Spurgeon, the prayers that God answers are the ones that begin with him.